If a man dies, shall he live again? What does it mean to be absent from the body and present with the Lord? Did Jesus go with a thief to paradise on Good Friday? Did the souls of dead people really cry out from below the altar? Pastor Bohr answers these questions and more in the amazing series Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, once again, we're thankful for the privilege of being here. And as we open your holy word, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. We realize that in these last days, there is much mishandling of your holy word. We just ask that you will help us to handle your word with reverence, recognizing that it's holy from a holy God. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of opening its pages, and we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. In our study today, we're going to discuss a parable of Jesus known as the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And I'd like to begin by reading this parable so that we have a clear picture of what the parable is all about. I'm reading from Luke chapter 16 and verses 19 through 31. And I'm not going to make any remarks. I just want you to have the parable clear in your mind. And then we will make some remarks about several aspects of the parable. It says there, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead." This is the famous parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Now some people question whether this was really a parable. And really there's no reason to question whether it was a parable or not. Because this formula, there was a certain man, is used repeatedly in the Gospel of Luke to describe a parable. Let me just read you one example other than this one from Luke 16. Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke 15 and verse 11. This uh, is very similar in its introductory formula. It says, He also said to His disciples, There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. Clearly this is a parable. And it's introduced in the same way as the parable of the rich man and Lazarus with the formula, there was a certain rich man. 
So there's no doubt that the story of the rich man and Lazarus is a parable. It is not an actual story that took place in real life. Now many times Jesus would take the parables that existed in His day and He would turn them upside down and give them a strange twist. This parable of the rich man and Lazarus was not invented by Jesus. It was actually a well-known story that was used by the rabbis. But for the rabbis the poor man Lazarus was the one who would end up burning in the fires of hell, whereas the rich man who had enjoyed the blessings of God in this life would end up in Abraham's bosom. Jesus simply took their common story, He turned it upside down, and He gave it an unexpected twist. Now it's important to realize that this parable was actually told because of the Pharisees. Jesus was actually speaking to the Pharisees in this parable. Notice Luke chapter 16 and verse 14, immediately before the parable we find this statement about the audience that Jesus was speaking to. It says there, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard these things, and they derided Him. So the special audience that Jesus is speaking to is the Pharisees. Incidentally, this parable is found in the Gospel of Luke. And according to the scholars, Luke was written especially to those of Greek mentality. It was written to the Greeks. And therefore the anthropology of this parable fits very well with the Greek idea of an immortal soul that flies off at the moment of death. Jesus is taking a story that is used in His day and age. He's not saying that the story is true. He's simply speaking to these people in a language that they can understand. Now I need to say a few things about the Pharisees. Flavius Josephus, who was himself a Pharisee, by the way he was born in the year 37 A.D., told us very clearly what the beliefs of the Pharisees were regarding the nature of man. I read from the book Wars of the Jews uh, this following statement from Josephus. They, that is the Pharisees, say that all souls are incorruptible, but that the souls of good men only are removed into other bodies but that the souls of bad men are subject to eternal punishment. But the Sadducees take away the belief of the immortal duration of the soul, and the punishments and rewards in Hades. In other words, the Sadducees did not believe in the immortality of the soul, they did not believe in the afterlife. The Pharisees believed that all souls are incorruptible, they believed in the immortality of the soul. By the way, the Bible corroborates the view that Josephus is expressing. In Acts chapter 23 and verse 8, Acts 23 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul says, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So in other words, if Jesus had told this parable to the Sadducees, it wouldn't have made any sense to them. Jesus is using the flame, frame of reference of the Pharisees to get a great truth across. He's using the belief system that they have to teach a great truth, which we're going to notice in a little while. Now Ellen White is in harmony with both the book of Acts and Josephus on the issue of whom Jesus was addressing in this parable. In the book Christ's Object Lessons, page 263, we find this statement. In this parable, Christ was meeting the people on their own ground. The doctrine of a conscious state of existence between death and the resurrection was held by many of those who were listening to Christ's words. The Savior knew of their ideas and he framed his parable so as to inculcate important truths through those preconceived opinions. In other words, he took their preconceived ideas and he framed this parable to teach them a great truth within their frame of thinking. Incidentally, 
even the disciples of Jesus had assimilated this false view that there were ghosts or spirits of the dead hovering over the earth. Notice for example Mark chapter 6 and verse 49. This is when Jesus is walking on the sea and the disciples were frightened and I want you to notice why they were frightened. It says there in Mark 6 verse 49, but when they saw him walking upon the sea they supposed it had been a spirit, in other words a ghost, and cried out. So even the disciples of Jesus had assimilated this idea that the soul of man is immortal, leaves the body at the moment of death, and can come back as an disincarnated spirit or as a ghost. Now it's interesting to notice uh, the description that Josephus gives about what happened according to the Pharisees when a person died. And I'm going to read as it is described by a scholar the belief system of the Pharisees about what happened immediately at the moment of death. By the way this is in Josephus' work Discourse to the Greeks Concerning Hades. Here is the description. In this work Josephus, Josephus explains that Hades was a subterraneous region which has two compartments. One compartment or region contained a lake of unquenchable everlasting fire, and the other was called the bosom of Abraham. So you have this idea of a subterraneous region, it's divided into two parts, the bosom of Abraham, by the way it's on the right side, and the other side is a lake of burning everlasting fire. This scholar continues saying, according to this view, when the wicked and the righteous died, they were taken down a descent where there was a gate guarded by an archangel accompanied by a host of angels. At the gate the wicked were taken by the angels to the compartment which was located on the left side. There was the lake of unquenchable fire where they were to suffer everlasting punishment. The righteous on the other hand, were guided by the angels to the compartment on the right side where the bosom of Abraham was located. Between these two regions there was a great gulf which did not allow the righteous to pass to the region of the wicked or the wicked to the region of the righteous. Now is it obvious that Jesus is picking up on this idea that is being expressed by Josephus in his work Discourse to the Greeks Concerning Hades? Obviously yes. Jesus does not believe in this concept, Jesus is simply speaking within their own frame of reference. Now I want you to remember the details uh, of what Josephus says happens to the dead when they die. Uh, because we're going to come back to this in the light of what the New Testament teaches about what occurs to man when man dies. Now the question is, does the Bible really speak about two regions where the dead are retained, uh, one eternally burning in the lake of fire and the other in the bosom of Abraham? The fact is the Bible does not have anything even close to this idea. The Bible is very clear that when a person dies they go to the grave. Let's notice what Jesus said. John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29. John chapter 5 and verses 28 and 29. Here Jesus says this, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice. By the way, if they're in the bosom of Abraham, or they're in the everlasting fire at the moment of death, why would Jesus call them from their graves? Verse 29, And they will come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now we need to ask the question, according to the New Testament, when are the wicked cast into the fire? Are they cast into the fire at the moment of death, or are they cast into the fire at the end of the age? The fact is that with this one possible exception, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, this parable, 
all of the other references in the New Testament state clearly that the wicked are cast into the fire at the end of the age, never at the moment of death. Let's notice a few examples. Matthew chapter 13 and verses 40 to 43. Matthew 13 verses 40 to 43. This is a fair, famous parable of the wheat and the tares. As therefore the tares, by the way they represent the wicked, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. When? In the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels. Now remember what Josephus said. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels and gather the wicked. When are the wicked gathered by the angels? Josephus says at the moments of what? Of death. What does the Bible teach? It's at the moment of the end of the world, or the end of the age. And so it says here, the Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. And now notice, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Let me ask you, was the rich man wailing and gnashing his teeth as he was in the fires? Yes, he was. The parable seems to indicate that it was at the moment of death. But the rest of the New Testament teaches very clearly that the wailing and gnashing of teeth is future at the end of the age. And then notice the last verse, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. When is it that the righteous are going to be in the kingdom of the father? At the end of the world. When are the wicked cast into the fire? at the end of the world, so it does not happen at the moment of death. Notice also Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 to 34 and then we'll also read verse 41 and verse 46. Matthew chapter 20, 25 and verse 31. Do you remember that Josephus says that the angels would uh, actually take the wicked and they would throw them down the left side into the everlasting fire and they would take the righteous at that point and they would place them in the bosom of Abraham? Well the, the question is when is it that the, that the righteous are going to be placed at the right hand? And when is it that the wicked are going to be placed at the left hand? And whose right hand and whose left hand? Notice Matthew 25 verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, by the way when is that? Is that at the moment of death? Of course not. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him that's the, the coming of Jesus, right? Then He will sit on the throne of His glory. Verse 32, all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another. When will they be separated? Is it at the moment of death that they go either to the bosom of Abraham or to the everlasting fire? Absolutely not. It's when He sits on the throne of His glory. He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will, verse 33, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. When is it that uh, the righteous are placed on the right hand and the wicked on the left? It's when Jesus comes in his kingdom. Verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then let's jump down to verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. By the way, later on in this series, we're going to deal with the issue of everlasting punishment and everlasting fire. So put a hold on that. The point that I want us to notice now is the, that the wicked are cast into the fire, not at the moment of death, but at the moment in which Jesus Christ comes in His kingdom at the end of the age. That's when He places the righteous on His right side and the wicked on His left side. Notice also Revelation 21 and verse 8, on when the wicked are cast into the fire. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. It says here, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part 
in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. When is it that the wicked are cast into the fire? At the moment of their first death or at the moment of their second death? It's second death. And second death always takes place after the millennium, after the thousand years of Revelation chapter 20. So if they're cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death after the millennium, it means that they were not cast into the fire at the moment of their death. Also Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15, we're not going to read this passage by the way, but I'm just going to refer to it. Revelation 20, 11 to 15 tells us that all of the nations will be gathered before the throne of Jesus Christ, and at that time Jesus Christ is going to open the books and He's going to show the wicked why they are outside the holy city, why they are lost. In other words, there's going to be a judgment of the wicked who are outside the holy city. And then we're told at the end of that passage in verses 14 and 15 that after the wicked have been judged they see why they were left outside the holy city then they are taken and cast into the lake of fire. Listen folks, those individuals who say that a person goes to hell when they die what they're doing is they're saying that they're going to hell without having a fair judgment to show that they deserved to go to the fire. God will not condemn the wicked to the fire until He has given them due process, until He has given them a fair trial. Now let's go to another issue. When is it, according to the Bible, that the righteous will be gathered together? Josephus said, well, the righteous will be gathered at the moment of death by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. But according to the Bible, when do the angels gather the righteous, and to whom do they gather the righteous? Matthew chapter 20, 24, and let's notice verse 31. It says here, speaking about Jesus, and He will send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet. By the way, what event is being described there? The second coming of Jesus, yes. And He will send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will, what? When is it that the angels gather? Not at the moment of death. They gather people at the second coming. It says, and He will send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven even unto the other. And by the way, who are the righteous gathered to? They are not gathered to the bosom of Abraham they are gathered to, to Jesus Christ. We're told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that we'll be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions, and then He says, I will gather you unto Myself. So there's no such idea as the angels at the moment of death gathering the righteous to the bosom of Abraham. The New Testament teaches that the angels will gather the elect, will gather the righteous, but they will gather them to Jesus Christ, not at the moment of death, but at the end of the age. Furthermore, we noticed in our last study that God forbade the idea of trying to communicate with what? With the dead. Have you noticed in this parable that actually dead people are talking to each other? Notice Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 27. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 27. Even Abraham in this parable is talking to the rich man. Would God allow Abraham to violate the idea of not communicating, the dead not communicating uh, with other dead people or with living people? Of course not. Notice Leviticus 20 verse 27. A man or a woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones, their blood shall be upon them. Another interesting detail about this parable is that the rich man is in the fires of hell with all of his body parts. Now I want you to notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19. What happens to the body when a person dies? You know as a minister I've done dozens and dozens of funerals and I can certify one thing and that is that the person who dies their body is in the casket and their body goes into the ground. I can see it. 
So the body does not go anywhere except into the casket and into the ground. Keep that in mind. Now notice Genesis 3.19. God said what was going to happen as a result of sin. God says to Adam, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall what? You shall return. Now, let me ask you, did Lazarus die and was he buried? Yes. Did the rich man die and was he also buried? Absolutely. Notice Luke 16 and verse 22. Luke 16 verse 22. It says, So it was that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was what? buried. So the question is, where would the body of the rich man be if he was buried? The body of, man, of this man would be in the grave. So the question is, what is he doing with all of his body parts in the burning fire? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now go with me to Luke chapter 16 and verse 23. Luke 16 and verse 23. It says there, And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his what? I, but wait a minute, when he died, where did, his, where did his eyes go? His eyes are part of his body. They went to the grave, right? But here in the fires, he has what? Eyes! By the way, this parable never says that the rich man died and he immediately went to the fires of hell. That is an assumption that people make. That in the parable, the rich man died, and immediately he went to burn in the fires. The parable does not say he immediately went to burn in the fires. The evidence seems to indicate that because he has body parts, this did not happen at death, but it will happen when? It will happen at the end of the age. Notice also Luke 16 and verse 24. Once again, the idea of body parts in the fire. If this is at the moment of death, why are body parts in the burning fires? The body parts should be in the grave. It says here in Luke 16 verse 24, Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger. Oh, so Lazarus after he dies he has fingers. Interesting. In water and cool my what? Oh, the rich man has a tongue there too. I thought that would have gone to the grave. It says, Cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Let me ask you, when is it that the body will be cast into the fires of hell? Is it at the moment of death, or is it at the, at the moment that Jesus comes in power and glory after the judgment of the wicked that they are cast into the fires? Notice Matthew 5, 29 and 30. Matthew 5, 29 and 30. The Bible is clear that the body is cast into the fires at the end of the age. Which means that this is not describing the rich man going directly to hell at the moment of death, because he has body parts. This must be describing the rich man being punished later on. The parable does not say that he went to the fires immediately. Notice what we find in Matthew 5, 29 and 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members, that is one of the members of your body, perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. What is it that's cast into hell? The whole body. The whole body. Can that happen at death? No, because at death the body goes where? It goes to the grave. Notice verse 30. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your, once again, your whole body to be cast into hell. Now this problem of body parts in the burning fire has led an individual called Robert Morey, who by the way is a staunch defender of the idea of the, of the immortality of the soul. In fact, he wrote a book called Death and the Afterlife, where he tries to prove uh, to the utmost of his ability that people have immortal souls that go to heaven when they die if they were good, or they go to hell if they were, if they were wicked. 
I want you to notice the admission that he makes regarding this parable. Everyone, says Robert Morey, understood that these parables and dialogues did not literally take place. It was understood that the rabbis used imaginative stories and dialogues as a teaching method. It was understood by all that these dialogues never took place. What is he saying? He said this story never took place. He continues saying, Jesus was merely using the dialogue method to get across the concept that there is no escape from torment, no second chance, and we must believe the Scripture in this life unto salvation. And this man wrote a book, by the way I have the book, and I've answered every argument with a fine-toothed comb, every argument that he uses in favor of the immortality of the soul, in favor of the idea that the righteous, the souls of the righteous go to heaven at death, the idea that the wicked go, the souls of the wicked go to hell at the moment of death. Every single thing that he says has a clear biblical answer. But it's interesting that he finds it necessary to admit that this story never actually took place. So the only story in all of the New Testament that would seem to indicate that a person went to suffer in the flames at the moment of death cannot be used because it never took place. All of the rest of the statements in the New Testament point to the fire punishment taking place at the end of the age. Now let's talk just a moment about the bosom of Abraham. What does this rich man represent? Or who does this rich man represent? Let's talk first of all about the bosom, what the bosom means. John 1 and verse 18. John chapter 1 and verse 18. The word bosom represents closeness. What do we do with the baby? We hug the baby close to our what? close to our bosom. It's a sign of closeness. It's a sign that this baby is our child. That there's a special link between us and our child. Now notice John 1 verse 18 on the idea of the bosom. It says here, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father he has declared him. Where is Jesus? He is in the bosom of the Father. Why are we told here that Jesus is in the bosom of the Father? Because Jesus has a special what? A special closeness to his Father. By the way, the argument sometimes is used even by Adventist preachers that, oh, the bosom of Abraham, that has to be an awful big place for people to, everybody to fit on Abraham's chest. But the fact is that Josephus did not literally mean that people were taken real close to the chest of Abraham. What he meant is that there was a region called the bosom of Abraham where those who had a close link or connection with Abraham were taken. Now, what does the rich man represent? There are clear clues in this passage. Go with me to Luke 16, and we're going to read verse 24, 25, 27, and then verse 30. Notice what it says, beginning in verse 24. The rich man. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham! Let me ask you, who claimed Abraham as father? The Jews, and more particularly the Pharisees. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. Now notice, but Abraham said, Son, hmm, this is a father-son relationship. Who would Abraham have called sons? His descendants, his seed. And who was the seed of Abraham? The Jews, exactly. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, see once again the idea of Father, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. 
For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. So the rich man has what? Five brothers. And he says to Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house, so that he can warn them so that they don't come to this terrible place. Now notice, Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let me ask you, who were the ones who had Moses and the prophets? The Jews. By the way, I believe that what we have here, the five brothers represent the different denominations of Judaism in the days of Christ. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the Essenes, the scribes. In other words, his brothers are those who have Moses and the prophets. The Jews were the ones who claimed to have Moses and the prophets. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 5, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. And then notice verse 30, and he said, no father Abraham, there it is again, no father Abraham. And now notice this, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Now there's a very, very important point, perhaps the most important point of this whole presentation. I want you to notice here that in the last verse, in verse 30, that the rich man says, no father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Let me ask you, did the rich man believe in the immortality of the soul? Yes. He's saying, send my, my brothers, send Abraham, or my, to, to, to my brothers, send Lazarus rather, to my brothers, from the dead, so that he can what? so that he can warn them and testify them. So the rich man is saying, send this dead man Lazarus to speak to my five brothers. From the dead, it says. But I want you to notice the answer of Jesus. The answer is found in verse 31. And he said, no father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead they will repent. Now no, that's verse 30, verse 31. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Are you catching? Did Jesus believe in the immortality of the soul? No. Jesus says, I will send someone, but someone who rises from the dead. The rich man is saying, send someone to my brothers from the dead. Are you catching my point? You're saying, well, it's a technicality. No, it isn't. You see, there's a word, a very important little Greek word, that is used in verse 31 that is not used in verse 30. And that's the word, rise from the dead. You see, the rich man says, send him from the dead. Jesus says, send one who has risen from the dead. By the way, if you want to notice that expression, rise from the dead, Luke 24, verse 46, it says, Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So did the rich man believe in the immortality of the soul? Of course he did. He says, send Lazarus from the dead to my brothers. Did Jesus believe in the immortality of the soul? He says, no, if I send someone, it's going to be someone that has risen from what? Someone that had ri has risen from the dead. So what does the rich man represent? The rich man represents the Jewish nation. Particularly what sect of the Jewish nation? Particularly the Pharisees. Now the question is, what does Lazarus represent? You know, there's a strange thing about this parable. One argument that people use to say that this isn't a parable is the fact that you have a proper name in this parable. You see, the parables never give proper names. They say there was a certain man, they never give the name of the person. But in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, you have an exceptional case because you have the name of Lazarus. The rich man is not named, but Lazarus is named. Why would you have a proper name here if this was a parable? Well, we'll notice that in, in a moment. But I want you to notice what this uh, beggar, Lazarus, represents. Go with me to Matthew 15, verses 26 and 27. Matthew 15, and verses 26 and 27. This is speaking about the woman who came to Jesus. She wanted her daughter healed. She kept coming after him. And Jesus finally acceded to her, to her wish. And uh, before he acceded to the wish, I want you to notice what Jesus said to her. This is verse 26. But he answered and said, 
it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Do you remember that, that Lazarus was at the bottom of the table of the rich man and crumbs fell from the table and the dogs came and licked his sores? Now notice this, it is not good, Jesus says, to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. By the way, this woman was a Canaanite woman. She was not a Jew. She was a Gentile. But notice the faith of this woman. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. So let me ask you, what does Lazarus represent? Lazarus represents the Gentiles. This woman was a Gentile. You have the same term of terminology. You have dogs, you have crumbs, you have the idea of the table, you have the idea of poverty. In other words, this Canaanite woman is what is represented by Lazarus in this story. By the way, it's important to realize that those who read this parable many times add concepts and ideas that are not found in the parable. Let me read you the parable as many Christians like to read it. They add ideas. This is their reading of the parable. Now it was that the beggar died, and immediately his soul was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and his body was buried. And being in torments in the everlasting flames of Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw the soul of Abraham afar off, and the soul of Lazarus in his bosom. Is that the way it says? Of course not. Then his soul cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on my soul, and send the soul of Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my, so my tongue, for my soul is tormented in this everlasting flame. Is that the way it reads? That's the way Christians read it. They add the word soul and everlasting and fire. You know, they put all kinds of concepts into, into it. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received the, your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now his soul is comforted, and your soul is tormented. The parable doesn't say any of those things. But that is the way in which it is interpreted by Christians. By the way, as I was mentioning, there is no proof that this takes place immediately after death. The word immediately is not used there. We've already noticed that body parts go into the fire at the end of the age. So this man, according to Jesus, must have been punished in the fires when? At the end of the age, with all of his body parts. By the way, let me tell you the reason why the name of Lazarus is used. There's a specific function. Jesus wanted to connect this parable with something that was shortly going to happen in his ministry. You say, what event was that? Well, the fact is that a short while after Jesus told this parable, a man called Lazarus was resurrected from the dead. Let's read about it in John chapter 11 and verses 43 and 44. John chapter 11 and verses 43 and 44. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he who had died, by the way, he had been dead four days, and he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. They will not believe even though someone, what? Rises from the dead. What was his name? Lazarus. His name was Lazarus. Believe in whom? The parable doesn't say. They won't believe even if someone raises from the dead. This story tells us that they did not believe in whom? they did not believe in Jesus. By the way, to whom did Moses and the, and the prophets point? They pointed to Jesus. Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. Now, when Lazarus was resurrected, that was the greatest sign of the Messiahship of Jesus. Imagine someone resurrecting a dead person. Did the Pharisees believe in Jesus when Lazarus was resurrected? 
By the way, did, La did Lazarus in a certain way go to these men and preach the truth about the resurrection of Jesus? He most certainly did. But he didn't go from the dead. He came after he had risen from the dead. Are you with me or not? Now notice, John 11, verses 46 through 50. John 11, verses 46 through 50. But some of them went away to the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees are in view. And told them the things Jesus did. That is, that he had resurrected Lazarus. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees, see there's the Pharisees again, gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will what? Believe. If they do not what? If they do not accept Moses and the prophets, they will not what? Believe even if someone rises from the dead. Who were they supposed to believe in? Jesus. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. In other words, instead of believing in Jesus, they said, We've got to get rid of this man. Was Jesus right when he said if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe even if a man called Lazarus rises from the dead? His words were proven true. See, if Jesus had not used the name of Lazarus, he could have not connected the two events, the parable, and what actually happened. By the way, do you know that they also wanted to kill Lazarus? Notice John chapter 12 and verses 9 and 10. John chapter 12 and verses 9 and 10. It says here, now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. And they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but they might also see whom? Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Poor Lazarus, they wanted to have him die another time. So it says, the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account, notice the reason why, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed, there's the word again, and believed in Jesus. Is this clear? Go with me now to John chapter 12 and verse 19. Look at the, at the complaint of the Pharisees. Because after this miracle, everybody wants to follow Jesus. Because Jesus has resurrected someone from the dead. Notice, John 12, verse 19. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. They're complaining about the fact that the whole world is following whom? Is following Jesus. By the way, were the Pharisees really children of Abraham? They were not really children of Abraham. You say, why weren't they children of Abraham? Well, literally they were children of Abraham, okay? They were descendants of Abraham, literally, according to the flesh. But they were not truly, in the spiritual sense, sons of Abraham. You say, why not? Let's look at it this way, and we're going to read a text in a moment. Abraham, according to John chapter 8, saw the day of Jesus, and he rejoiced. He longed for the day when Jesus would come. He saw in his son Isaac a symbol of the death of Jesus and the resurrection on the third day, according to Hebrews 11, verses 17 and 18. He, he believed that the Messiah, Jesus, would resurrect from the dead. And so, we find here Abraham, believing in Jesus who was to come. But those who were living in the days of Jesus, particularly the Pharisees, what did they want to do with Jesus? They didn't long to see Him come. They weren't happy about seeing His day. They wanted to get rid of Him. So let me ask you, were they really sons of Abraham? No. Jesus says, if you were sons of Abraham, you would love me. 
because Abraham loved me. He rejoiced to see my day. And you say that you're children of Abraham and you hate me. How can Abraham love me and you say you're his children and you hate me? Are you with me? How is it that Abraham believed in me and you who claim to be the children of Abraham don't believe in me? So notice what Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 44. John chapter 8 and verse 44. You know Jesus we usually think of Jesus as loving and kind and merciful, and He was all of that. But Jesus was never politically correct. He told things the way they were. With love, yes, but straightforward. Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. He's speaking to these people. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. And by the way, when Jesus pronounced his woes upon the scribes and the Pharisees, in Matthew chapter 23, we find these words in the woes on the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus called them serpents brood of vipers. I mean, who, who is the great serpent? The devil. So if they were serpents, where were they born from? They were born from Satan, that's right. Who wanted to see Jesus dead? Satan. They wanted to see Jesus dead. So who's the spirit of who were they reflecting? The spirit of their father, that's right. Now notice this, serpents brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Where were they going to end up? In hell, according to this. When? At the very moment they died, they were going to go directly to hell. Of course not. We've already noticed, Jesus is saying, serpents, brood of vipers, because you did not believe in Jesus, even though He resurrected a man called Lazarus, you are going to end up where? You're going to end up in the fires of hell. But he's not saying at the moment of death. He's speaking about the end of the age. By the way, if you go with me to Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, it speaks about what's going to happen at the end of the age. Do you notice in this parable that there's a reversal of roles? Where does the rich man end up? the one who claimed to be the son of Abraham, the one who had enjoyed all of the privileges and the covenants and the temple and the blessings of God, where did he end up? In hell. Where did the poor old Gentile, Lazarus, who, you know, was cast aside, ate the crumbs that fell, the crumbs of bread, of spiritual truth that fell from the table of the rich man? Where did he end up? He ended up in the bosom of Abraham. There was a reversal of roles. Now notice what Jesus says in Matthew 8 verses 11 and 12. And I say to you that many will come from east and west. Who do you think these are that will come from east and west? They are the Gentiles. You say, how do we know that? Because immediately before this, Jesus has healed the servant of a centurion, a Roman centurion. And Jesus says, I haven't found so much faith like this in Israel. Because, because the centurion says, you don't have to come to my house. Just speak the word. I believe you're the Messiah. Just say, just say it, and it'll happen. Jesus says, I haven't found faith like this in Israel. And then he says, and I say to you that many, that is Gentiles, like the centurion, many will come from east and west, and notice this, and sit down with Abraham, who are the ones who are going to sit down with Abraham? The Jews or the Gentiles? Hmm, the Gentiles who accepted Jesus. By the way, also the Jews who accepted Jesus. I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Where? In the kingdom of heaven. Now notice, but the sons of the kingdom, who are the sons of the kingdom? Those who descended from Abraham according to the flesh. But we're not spiritually children of the Lord. 
but the sons of the kingdom, notice, will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and what? And gnashing of teeth. When does the weeping and gnashing of teeth take place? It takes place immediately when they were going to die, right? No. It's when the righteous sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. Then is the wailing and gnashing of teeth. But listen, listen to what I'm going to say. Many Christians say, they actually add a word here where it says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They say there will be eternal weeping and gnashing of teeth. The fact is that the word eternal is not there. Is there going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth when the wicked go into the fires and are suffering separated from God? Yes, but it does not say everlasting weeping and gnashing of teeth. And by the way, this takes place at the end of the age. The crying out of the rich man does not take place immediately after his death. It takes place at the end of the age, according to this verse. Let's compare another one. Luke 13 and verse 28. Luke 13 and verse 28. This is a parallel passage to the one that we read from Matthew 8, 11, and 12. It says there, Jesus is speaking, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves, what? Yourselves thrust out. When is it that the wicked are going to be thrust out? When is it that the righteous are going to sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom at God's table? It is going to be at the end of the age, not at the moment of death. One final point that I would like to make is this. This uh, punishment of fire that is spoken of in the parable actually was fulfilled literally with the Jewish nation in the year 70. Do you know what happened in the year 70? In the year 70, the Roman legions came to the city of Jerusalem. They surrounded it. And there was a siege actually that lasted from uh, the year 68 till the year 70. It was a long siege because those inside the city did not want to give up. But eventually the Romans were able to break through the barriers, they entered the city, and they burnt the city, and they burnt the temple all the way to the ground. In other words, just like the parable says, Jerusalem was destroyed by fire.